Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to worship at North Shore Friends Church for Sunday, April 5th, 2020. I have just a few announcements to start with. Obviously, we are still coming to you via electronic means, and I welcome you to watch it on either Facebook or through the YouTube channel. You are also free to share it with your friends on social media. Um, also, we have um, a daily devotional going out each day on Facebook, and you may watch that and share that with your friends. There's a story time for kids that Brittany is doing, and she will be doing some other things this week to involve your children, so stay tuned for those announcements. Um, there will be some emails going out this week uh, for some things we need to help make our Easter celebration next week um, family-filled, even though we have to be socially distanced. I want to uh, acknowledge that Jennifer and Robbie had an anniversary this week and any other anniversaries or birthdays we might have had this week and celebrated. Congratulations to all of you. And then this morning I'd like to call attention to the flowers on the altar. Uh, those are in memory of Margaret White. Thank you for all of your uh, expressions of love and compassion during this difficult time. I think that is all the announcements we have, uh, and so without further ado, let us uh, move into time of worship. Hosanna, loud Hosanna. Sing along with me. This is one you have to almost stand up with. So, here we go. Thank 
have two readings this morning. The first is from 1 Kings chapter 4, starting with verse 20. Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand by the sea. They ate and drank and were happy. Solomon was sovereign over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates to the land of the Philistines, even to the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. Jumping to verse 29, God gave Solomon very great wisdom, discernment, and breadth of understanding as vast as the sand on the seashore, so that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else. His fame spread throughout all the surrounding nations. He composed 3,000 proverbs and his songs numbered 1,005. He would speak of trees from the cedar that is in the Lebanon to the hyssop that grows in the wall. He would speak of animals and birds and reptiles and fish. People came from all the nations to hear the wisdom of Solomon. They came from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. And then a reading from Matthew chapter 2, starting with verse 6. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and they put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are privileged to continue to lift your name on high. And we offer thanks for this day and for the opportunity to be here together in worship even if we are geographically distanced one from another. We seek to, during this time, to put aside the concerns of our daily lives, to let go of all the demands that crowd upon us, and simply be present here to your spirit and your words. In the spirit of the psalm, may we be still and know that you are God. We offer you prayers of thanksgiving for life and all the things that make life good as we discover that anew. We thank you that we continue to have enough and for the lesson that we are learning on what is enough. We thank you for the blessings of increased family time, the blessing of a slower pace and the blessing of a closer communion with you. We confess that though there are evidences of you all around us, we are often more concerned about the condition of our planet and our fellow man. We know that many in the flock that is North Shore Friends Church are afraid and fearful and we lift these concerns to you. We seek forgiveness for where our faith and our walk have failed. And we ask that you forgive us and bring us to a place of rightness with you. We ask for strength to trust more and fear less. We lift up those who are ill. We remember those whose jobs and incomes have been threatened. We remember those who mourn. We remember those who are pregnant or young, and we ask a special blessing upon them. As the present situation creeps ever closer to our circle of friends, we ask that you keep us safe, and yet allow us to be beacons of light in a world of fear and darkness. We ask that you be with the first responders, and we specifically remember Jennifer and the government and the leaders in this time of uncertainty 
as neither has known anything like this before. Grant us all wisdom and patience in this time of shortage. Grant us a spirit of forgiveness when we feel that we have been wronged or as we deal with feelings of anger and resentment. We remember others across the world who are worshiping this morning. There are many churches struggling to adapt to the changing times. Many who do not have the resources to worship online or are struggling with that curve. We pray for them and for their church communities and that they might be able to keep their church family ties strong during this stressful time. We seek for ways to connect with people outside our personal bubbles in ways that are meaningful. Lord, we are so grateful this morning for Corey, who has the skill to make our technological worship work. We thank you for his time and his talent. We thank you for his dedication. We ask that you continue to be present in this service across addresses and communities, and that you continue to find it a pleasing worship sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. We are continuing this morning with our Jesus in every book of the Bible. And yes, today is, in case you've missed it, Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. A lot of fun. Um, really thankful to Corey for what he was able to do with our little videos this morning. Palm Sunday is the start of Holy Week, which begins with the triumphal entry into Jerusalem by Jesus on a donkey to the crucifixion and eventual resurrection of Jesus. This is historically the most sacred of weeks in the Christian faith, more so than Christmas. Many churches will have several services this week, all online, and historically Jerusalem sees its biggest crowds this week as pilgrims flock to the streets. This year Jerusalem is shuttered and closed, and yet it cannot still the worship in our hearts. As I was planning this series out long, you know, last fall, long time ago now, seems three lifetimes ago, I took a little liberty with the order of the books in the Old Testament so that we would land on Kings and Chronicles today. Wow, that's four books, four books. First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. If you're checking them off, we just made a whole lot of forward momentum this Sunday. These four books are considered together because they all deal with the same thing. The story of the kings of Judah and then the story of Israel and Judah as separate nations under separate kings are discussed in them. There's a lot of overlap between the two books. They tell a lot of the same stories. If you sit down and you read them front to back, it reads like a history book. But the timeline gets a little wonky. Some stories seem slightly different, and the tone and the emphasis are different. John would be sitting right there, and he would be going, yeah, history, go history. He loves to read history. This is the mother load of history books. For those of you who don't like history or don't understand why we study history, you can say, wow, she covered four history books in one Sunday. Yippee skippy. But these books cover the kings that ruled. There are three main differences between these two sets of books. The writer of Chronicles, or the chronicler, focuses more on David and Solomon. And while it does not whitewash their failures, it does not dwell on them either. Chronicles focuses on the kings of Judah, 
which was the southern kingdom, the one where Jerusalem remained the capital, and the kings were the line of the house of David. And lastly, where kings acknowledges that God dealt with the wickedness of Israel's kings by punishing even them and their descendants. That would be the northern kingdom who broke away and whose kings were not of the line of David. God punished those kings individually and their descendants. Chronicles focuses on God dealing with obedient and disobedient kings in their own lifetime, one at a time, individually. Chronicles is more inspirational than the judgmental book of Kings. These differences are probably not what you think about and study when you do this in second grade Sunday school, when you are learning about the different kings. And I'll admit, it is difficult to keep all of them straight and which kingdom they work with and who was good and who was bad. And yes, to answer the skeptics, these two books often tell the same story slightly differently. It doesn't make one story right and one story wrong. It doesn't bring the whole Bible into a place of suspicion. I would remind you quickly of an illustration I've used before. I have here two scrapbooks. This scrapbook was made by my mother. Over a trip we took to Hawaii. This scrapbook was made by me over the same trip to Hawaii. We all went to Hawaii at the same time. We had mostly the same activities. We had a few different ones, but mostly the same activities. But these two books are different because they are told from different perspectives and to different audiences. Mom's scrapbook is for her and dad and their perception of the trip. My scrapbook is made from a perspective of the Rick, Robin, Rachel, Richie, and Randy clan with the idea that my children would look back at a later point and remember that family vacation. Although mom and I used a lot of the same embellishments and papers, the two scrapbooks look completely different because we have different styles of scrapbooking. Kings and Chronicles serve different audiences and different purposes to tell the same story. We go back in time, we remember that the Jews as a whole begged for an earthly king. They no longer wanted judges or prophets. They wanted to be ruled by an earthly king, one they could see and touch. And so God gave them Saul who was followed by David, and then Solomon. And it really didn't work out all that well for them to have an earthly king. But an earthly king serves to point the way to Jesus as the ultimate king, the king of kings. In both Kings and Chronicles, we see man as the imperfect king and Jesus as our perfect king, our reigning king. Fast forward. Today is Palm Sunday and I read a selection that shows Jesus' triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. This was as close as he came in his earthly ministry to being a triumphant king on this earth. It. Many who followed him thought this was the start of the overthrow. They had followed him for years and now this was it. He was going to take control, he was going to reign, he was going to overthrow the Romans. 
he was going to be the physical deliverer. But as we search the Old Testament prophecies, nowhere does it say he was going to overthrow the Romans. Nowhere does it say he was going to set up his kingdom on earth at that particular time. The judge cycle we've talked about before had an overthrow component to it. But although Jesus was the perfect judge, at this time, a military overthrow was not in the plan. There is a time in the future where God will be the reigning king. But this is not it. Let's look at this triumphal entry a little bit. It's important to note that Jesus rides a donkey, not a horse. The donkey is a symbol of a peaceful king. A horse is a warrior king. Jesus rides in on this peaceful donkey to be king of kings. And he shows the wisdom of Solomon in so many ways, and yet, unlike the human kings, he is incorruptible. Even the best kings in Kings and Chronicles had moments in which they were still human. Some more spectacular moments than others. But everyone has sinned. They were all human. I promise you it's allergies. My nose itches. Sorry. Every one of the kings in Kings and Chronicles eventually died. Jesus willingly gave up his life for our sins, but will live forever. The next time Jesus enters Jerusalem, it will be as triumphal king. Whatever that means. I don't have a clear picture of what the end times will look like. We have clues and we struggle, much like the Old Testament struggled for what Jesus' coming would look like. So I don't have all the answers. I'm seeing a lot of guesses right now, but I don't have the answers. Don't think we know when. But Jesus will come and reign eternally. Now, to the magic of Corey. He's going to show you some pictures here as I describe them. I've been saving them for 10 months now since I got back from my trip, specifically for this day, for Palm Sunday. Last summer, we were given the opportunity while we were in Jerusalem to walk the Palm Sunday road, or we could ride the bus. We had our choice. Um, and looking out from across the Kidron Valley, from the side of the Mount of Olives over to Jerusalem, it's not that far. We can do this. I can walk it. I'm going to walk it. I want to experience all and I want to see all and I want to go home with no regrets. So of course I'm going to walk it. <laughs> okay. Mount of Olives is not mountains like we think of the Rocky Mountains. But it's a definite incline. It's a pretty steep incline. And when the roads and footpaths were made over the Mount of Olives thousands of years ago, they didn't do it with government engineers figuring out how to make the grade manageable. They didn't do it with lots of switchbacks so you came down gradually. No, it was kind of like, there's where we want to go, let's go. It's pretty direct. It's footpaths that have evolved into roads with just a couple of turns to smooth out the incline. The road I walked down was narrow. It was half the size of the platform I'm standing on. It was cliff hugging. You had mountain here and they had put up a barrier but there was drop off there. It was steep. Not your happy 12% incline. It was steep. 
and in my very good walking shoes with lots of tread, I am struggling for traction as we go down. Gravity works. I'm struggling to imagine walking it in sandals on a gravel road with no safety walls. And then I got it in my head that I was perched on a donkey going down this incline. And I got to giggling really bad with the crowds pressed in and you know the donkey not real sure what it's doing although it's a very sure-fitted beast. Lurching down as the donkey moves down the hill. And hopefully no one's falling off the mountain. And yet, on this Palm Sunday, people are laying their cloaks across the donkey and on the ground. And they're lining the streets with no safety wall behind them, waving their palm branches like a ticker tape parade, shouting. I had trouble just talking to people on our descent, not because I was out of breath, but I was really nervous about falling. And I was concentrating on not doing that. I saved that for Jerry several days later. You eventually get to the bottom of this incline and you pass through, and I mean right through, right through, not detour around it, but right through, the Garden of Gethsemane, which is going to figure so prominently in just four days. And then you start back up an incline. You did hear me say this was a valley, right? The Kidron Valley, which means the Mount of Olives is over here and the rocky outcropping that Jerusalem is is over here, and so you gotta go through the valley down here. Up through what we call the Golden Gate that is sealed now, and it's not the original gate, but it's in about the right spot, into the city as reigning king, this is Jesus, down the mountain, through the Garden of Gethsemane, back up the incline, through the Golden Gate, which is where kings entered the city of Jerusalem on a donkey, full of peace and love. I had many aha moments on this trip. This one figures near the top. A sight to behold. For Jesus, as he stood near the top of the Mount of Olives, looking out over Jerusalem, spread below him. The crowds cheering him, knowing that in just a few days they would turn. The descent through the Garden of Gethsemane and the entrance through the Golden Gate. Very powerful. Very, very powerful. Our takeaway today needs to include the magnitude of Jesus as reigning king. Queen Elizabeth has reigned for 68 years. The longest British monarch in history and the fourth longest ever of any historically recorded monarchs. 68 years is more than my lifetime. Probably more than most of y'all's. Eventually, she will die. Even the monarch who reigned the longest, who is Louis XIV of France, eventually died. And they reigned no more. Jesus isn't going to die. His earthly body that he willingly gave up and sacrificed died. But then his resurrected body rose again and he will reign forever. Mankind, humankind, has not been the greatest as reigning kings and queens. We've had some good ones and we've had some bad ones. Jesus will definitely be a good one. He will reign forever and never fail. As Handel wrote in his wonderful masterpiece, the Hallelujah Chorus, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, 
for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The kingdom of this world is become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever, forever and ever, forever and ever. King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this picture of Jesus entering Jerusalem triumphantly, riding a donkey peacefully as our Savior and King, not to overthrow mankind's rule, but to reign as King of Kings. And no matter what life throws at us right now, you are still the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we excitedly lift that on high and shout, Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, Amen. We're going to close today by singing, Calvary Covers It All.
Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heavens. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.